Why would a 21st century entrepreneur be at all interested in the story of a bunch of 18th century British criminals transported across the world to a remote, harsh place for punishment? Well, you might be surprised to learn that it was never envisaged by the original planners of this settlement that what became of that settlement, a thriving economic city like Sydney, would ever happen. In fact, it was a bunch of convicts who became entrepreneurs that actually proved that this colony could be an economically successful place. I'm sure you're going to be surprised to learn that the richest and most successful businessman and woman that Australia has ever produced were ex-convicts of that original settlement. But this story on this walk today is not a story about heroes. In fact, it's more a story about moral ambiguity. Everybody associated with this colony was in a morally conflicted way from the very beginning. First of all, they invent, invaded a very successful human civilization that had been here for 40,000 years, that of the Gadigal people. And within the colony in themselves, there was much conflict and fighting. There was a governor overthrown by the military. There were government officials and military officials paying convicts to do their dirty work, all in the, the interests of their own selves. But despite that beginning and that moral conflict, within 60 years of settlement, this place would become the richest country in the world on a per head of white population basis. So perhaps to you, the entrepreneur, Sydney and Australia are a reminder that despite whatever harshness you, you faced in your background, whatever trespasses you com committed against others or committed against you, there's still the very real hope for a very successful future. And in fact, it might actually be that background that enables you to think about how you can structure that to your benefit into the future. Finally, I hope that today's walk is a reminder to us in the 21st century of the tensions between what constitutes a moral life and what constitutes a successful life. I'm Peter Davison. I like to think of myself as an entrepreneurial historian and enthusiast. I hope you find this of interest. The reason why I took you here is because up until recently, historians have thought that the first fleet landed on the southern side of Circular Quay. But recent witness testimony, i.e. letters of convicts, showed that there seems to be a consensus that the first fleet arrived on the western side, which is in front of us here. And analyzing the topography of, this, of the coastline, there was only one spot that wasn't too rocky where they possibly could have landed. And it's just probably within 10 meters in front of us here where the first fleet first landed. Now there is a sign around the corner that says it's possible they could have landed here, but the historical consensus seems to be that this is where the first fleet first landed, right? So, what are we doing here? I mean, what is Sydney doing here? How did it all happen like this? And how did it start? Well, Sydney itself was a startup. A startup with a, please, Sorry. welcome. No, no, you're welcome. Social enterprise goal, okay? It had social enterprise ambitions. You know the story. The, 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 the jails were overcrowded. The American Independence War had just been lost, so they had to find another place. But the general consensus, even though it wasn't very well thought out, and you'll see along the way, the ways it was not thought out. This was a genuine lean startup, okay? Um, 
the general consensus was this was a place of punishment. This was not a place to smash it out of the park, get rich and have a world international city. This was a place to punish bad people that hadn't done enough wrong to get hung. Okay? The idea was that it was just going to make enough money to be self-sufficient. Now obviously there were differences of opinions, but that's a running thing that you see throughout the early history. And it's going to be one of the conflicts you see that defines how Sydney got to be where it is. The problem is that that social enterprise model was pretty well doomed from the start. They constantly had droughts. Sydney is not a very good environment to grow stuff, certainly of the English type of crop. So crops would fail. And bear in mind you're five months here away from telling England you've got a problem and then another five months from getting the answer back. Okay, so you can imagine the stress that we're starting to build here. Not only that, please, yeah, you're, not only that, you had a number of store ship missions that were lost at sea, were shipwrecked, that were meant to be reju rejuvenate this colony with, with supplies, and they completely got wrecked. So the governors, and particularly the military, were like, man, what, what, what did we get, get ourselves into? Especially the military, because they're like, dude, we didn't do any bad stuff. It's those dudes who did bad stuff. Why are we on rations, man? And part of the solution that the governors used was to give them certain privileges to sell stuff that was landing here when it did, the military, and make a profit out of it. And that adds to all sorts of economic and social complexities that were going to dog Australia, and Sydney in particular, for the, for the next 20 or 30 years. It was pretty well doomed from the start. And they kept, when they did send supplies they kept sending more convicts it's like you guys got to suffer man that's what this is all about but the governors and the and the military realized this was not sustainable and our next stop we'll see ways that they try to address this the social enterprise idea was not working and you had a bit of a conflict here because the british government said no that's how it's got to be. This is for punishment. And the government and the military were, were not happy with that. And what they thought was, hmm, we have an advantage here that we're not too far from India and we're not too far from China. Now, in those days, the startup scene, prior to the Industrial Revolution, so about the 18th century, the startup scene, if you wanted to get out of your, li your boring life and go and do some adventurous thing with a chance to get rich, it was to get involved in trade. Get on a boat, go sail the seas and see exotic places. And in fact, that's how venture capital started. Boats were loaded up with stuff, people would invest in that mission, and then if it survived, and that's a very big if, they'd get a share of the profits when, when they brought the stuff back home. That's actually the origins of venture capital. The problem with that for Sydney is the business model of trading. See, the business model of trading was you send a boat somewhere, you pack it full of stuff, you bring it somewhere, you sell it, you pick up something else, then you go to the next place and you sell it, and then right? So your boat is always full of stuff, you're always monetizing. Australia didn't have any stuff, right? At that point, we couldn't even feed ourselves. So the business model wasn't gonna work. It was a real problem. Unless we paid ridiculous prices to cover the mission back, right? And the British taxpayer wasn't gonna wear that. So enter this guy, a young guy called Robert Campbell. Now, Robert Campbell was this he came from a small Scottish town. He had been doing business for a while in his small Scottish town and basically failed. And his dad said, well, why don't you go work with your brother John in, in Calcutta? 
and he'd had a successful trading business licensed by the English East India Company, which was the English monopoly at that particular point. And he said, why don't you go join your brother? So he went and joined his brother. The year before Robert joined his brother, the brother's company sent a ship to Sydney, and check out this for targeted keyword marketing, the name of the ship was called the Sydney Cove, right? He was really obviously trying to create a relationship with Sydney. They wanted to see if there was anything that could be done here. Sadly, the Sydney Cove crashed off the coast of Tasmania and everything was lost. So when Robert was sent over here, one of the first things he was supposed to do was try to come and clean that up and see if there's anything could be salvaged. And while he's there, take a load to Sydney and see if there we could still do anything. And check out this for keyword marketing. He was on a boat called the Hunter. The name of the governor at the time was Governor Hunter, right? These guys, I think, earliest form of, <laughs> right? Um, it's a true story. That, that, that's how they would name them, to try to build a relationship. And that was a really important part of Robert's story because he immediately started to try to build a relationship here. He built, he bought some land just across here. This, you can see Campbell's Cove. This is what it's, why it's called Campbell's Cove. Plus, he decided to build a house and a wharf. And he was very interested in getting a warehouse. Now, the warehouse solved a critical entrepreneurial problem because the warehouse allowed him to store stuff and sell it at opportune times and also for producers here to store their stuff and then sell it at opportune times, right? It was like a very, plus it mixed, I was telling you about there was a bit of an economic problem with the military starting to control everything. Well, that, that was like an alternative of where you could store stuff, right? That started to shake the, the, the system up a bit. We still had the problem though, Robert. What are, we, what are you gonna send back, man? What are you gonna send back? There was timber. But, you know, that's not a, the killer app, right? <laughs> the killer app of Sydney, you're probably not going to read this in your, I bet you get, didn't get taught this in your class, because I just read it a few days ago. Because no, I, <laughs> no, the killer app for Sydney that, that solved that eco entrepreneurial problem was seals, man. Seals. The animal seals? Seals, yeah. The animal seals. Yeah, it's a bit of a sad story for the seals, to be honest. But <laughs> they found that there, yeah, I know. They found that there were tens and tens, hundreds of thousands of seals off the coast of Bass Strait and off the western coast of New Zealand. And seals were really good for two things at that time. Oil. Oil. And fur. And fur. What do they use the fur for? I mean, this could be anything. Yeah, that's... But there was one killer app for the seals, uh, for the seal fur. Hats, bruh. Everyone was, hats were just taking off, you know, everyone. Why don't we have hats anymore? Right? Have you ever thought about that? Everyone used to wear hats. And they could command a very high price. So, sealing was it. Sealing was the thing that solved this entrepreneurial problem. So, when Robert came over here again on a second mission, he built the warehouse, he asks if he can live here, and he does a really clever thing that I'm not sure you entrepreneurs would take the risk of taking, but he goes and marries the sister of the dude who was running the government warehouse, <laughs> right? So he's like, hey, it's to sort of smooth things over, okay? So, look, there's not many heroes in this story today, okay? Australia, first of all, I can, I'm an economic historian, now and we, we're told there's no heroes it's all about the great invisible hand of the market but no but honestly Australia is definitely something that has a very confused question of character convicts right governors military there's lots there's a conflict of character Robert was probably one of the good dudes because he actually believed in this in this colony but he really was just doing it, you know, to make money and make a life. 
But in those days, you would dedicate yourself to your business. It would become your life, right? So anyway, he becomes a, he retires in Canberra as all good retired entrepreneurs do. And, uh, and I want to read something because character is very important and I want to read what his biographer wrote about his character. You'll see why character becomes a very critical issue. But I'm going to read something that his, his biographer wrote about him, about his character. And it just sort of, you know, he was a bit anti-British. There was a lot of Scots around here. I would say Scottish people were more important than British people. To honor. The first governors were Scottish as well, but Robert was certainly a Scot, and they had a bit of a thing against the British, right? Here's what she said. Margaret Stephen, a Merchant Campbell belongs to a class of men notable, notable for its uniform and almost traditional character. The class can best be described as men who had grown up in the hard school of life, calculating and daring at the same time, above all temperate and reliable, shrewd and completely devoted to their business, with strictly bourgeois opinions and principles, which means that largely they're doing it for their family and for their legacy, right? I think he did care about Sydney, but in the end you're going to see a lot of people just doing things in their own interest and having a massive impact. Okay, so that's the story of Robert. That here is Squire's Landing. He, one of our characters is going to be James Squire. That has no connection to James Squire apart from the name, but, but it's a very lovely place, and, and that is named after one of the first fleece convicts. So we're going to go move on to the next one to see one of the people that Robert helped. One of the other things that Robert gave was credit to people. So you, currency was a problem in Australia. There was, there was no currency. So he extended credit to a lot of these entrepreneurs, including the convict entrepreneurs. And you'll see at our next stop, one of the people who smashed it that Robert gave the start to because of the extension of credit. Okay. Oh, by the way, so these things here, these are storehouses. They were built in 1850. They are Campbell storehouses. Campbell smashed it. You know, he, he had a bit of a legacy here going on. They weren't his original warehouses but they were built for Campbell's company. Now we're jumping a little bit around history. He's around 1806. The sealing industry is around about 1800 and a lot of things happen in between. But because of geography, we're gonna cover him next. He was sent to kick some colonial ass, man, to, to, to restore law and order. That means everyone to know their place. He heard that the military were getting too crazy with their monopoly of the grog trade. They were making people accept their salaries in grog and people would misuse that. And it was meaning people weren't working as hard. And then the farmers who were working, working hard were paying a very high price for the grog that they had to trade with. He came over to kick, he's a really domineering type of dude, right? And he came over to, to sort of restore law and order. However, he pissed off too many people. Not only did he piss off the military, which was pretty dangerous, he pissed off, and you'll see later on, some of the very important convict entrepreneurs. Right, so he's kind of picking, pissing off business, which he's sort of there to break the monopoly up, but now he's pissing off them as well. And he pissed off enough people that they decided to arrange, the army decided to walk to his place at Government House, arrest him and throw him out as governor and put in their own dudes. Yeah, man, that's, that's, that's true story. It's happening to this guy. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah, he got thrown out in the mutiny before. But, um, so when he gets there, his daughter, because his wife doesn't like seafaring at all, his daughter's there, she's got an umbrella and she, say, and she says, shh, Stab me in the heart before you, you take my father. And they're a bit shaken because they thought, wow, this is, this is a, these dudes are serious. They've got, you know, they really, they really think they're in the right. So they didn't do anything to her, but they walked into Bly. Apparently, he was on the toilet at the time, which was, they just say it was too, the description is too disgraceful to mention what had, right? But that, that's what we read from those, okay? There is a famous cartoon where he's being dragged out under, under a bed. He wasn't under a bed. He was just probably, yeah, you know, 
in the toilet. Um, one of the defining things as a convict entrepreneur is to work is, is asking yourself which side you are. Are you on Rob Bly's side or are you not? I, I often wonder when, when Murray was interviewing Malcolm Turnbull, because his middle name is Bly. Was, was his dad a fan of William Bly? It's still one of the defining questions in Australia. This, there's no good guy or bad guy. Some people think he was trying to do a good thing by breaking up the monopoly, but he was just too heavy handed for this weird, colony of contradictory characters. Okay, we'll keep going. The second fleet was a disaster, like horrific. 25% um, of the convicts died on the way under like horrific conditions. They were all chained to each other, their disease was breaking out, they were starving. Um, and then by the time they got here, within a few months, 40% of that whole fleet had died, right? So if you stole a handkerchief and you're on here, you died in the most miserable circumstances. People were tried for this, no one was ever convicted. If what happened to the second fleet had happened to the first fleet, I doubt there would be a Sydney. That's how bad it was. Robert Campbell arrives and he extends credit. Now we're jumping ahead in time a little bit here. This building here was built for a, a guy called John Piper. You know Piper's Point? Well that, that's what it was built for. However, he was caught for embezzling funds. He tried, this is, you don't read this in too many history books because you know, the descendants are still alive, you know, and he's an honourable character. You might want to edit that bit out. Anyway. Um, but he was caught for embezzling funds and he tried to drown himself. And they had to sell this off. And they sold this off in about 1823, six, eight, to, to the, a lady. <laughs> One of the ladies that Robert Campbell helped. Now imagine you're, just imagine this, you're 13 years old, okay? You've probably pretty good family, but your parents have died, both of them. You're living with your grandmother. You're probably not in, you're not that into boys, to be honest. And you're not sure what your future's gonna be, because you know, you could marry, but you could join, go and join those days a female factory, or you could go into prostitution, or you could get married. They're your options, and she's 13 years old. So, one day she takes a horse, she dresses up as a boy, because she thought boys have a, a big advantage here. She calls herself James Burrow, dresses up as a boy. She steals a horse from next door neighbor and she goes on a crazy ride across town with this crazy mission. Now, again, this isn't part of the descendants history, but there is records to show that she did try to sell the horse because she wanted to, wanted to run away, make some money and make a new life and see what she could do, get out of this situation. 13 years old. The guy she was trying to sell the horse to obviously kind of realised that it's probably, this is probably not a true story, <laughs> dobbed her in and she was sentenced to death because horse stealing was, you died for that. She got a reprieve, she's young, right? They said, okay, we'll go easy on you and send you in a, with, in a boat full of criminals in terrible conditions for five months to this place that no one's ever heard of before. And that's what happened. By the time she was 15, she was shipped over here. And on this trip, she meets this guy who happened to work, who's about seven years older than her, happened to work for the English East India Company. He was just on a, you know, just like on the taxi on the way to Australia. And obviously, Something happened there, right? Some, some chemistry happened. She arrived in, ta in, in, in uh, Australia, and I want to read you her letter. This is her just as she's standing on the boat about to, about to alight. 15 years old at this stage, right? My dear aunt, we arrived here on the 7th, and I hope it will answer better than we expected for. I write this on board ship. It looks a pleasant enough a place. We shall have but four pair of trousers to make a week 
and we shall have a pound of rice a week and four pound of pork besides green, greens and other vegetables. They tell me I am here for life, which the government told me I was only for seven years, which grieves me very much to think of it. But I'll watch every opportunity to get away in two or three years. But I'll make myself as happy as I can in my present and unhappy situation. I'll give you further satisfaction when I get there and am settled. I am well and hearty as I ever was in my life. She's obviously putting on a brave face, right? I desire you will answer me by some ship that is coming and let me know how the children are and all inquiring friends. So I must conclude because we are in a hurry to go. Remember my love to my sister and Aunt Wamsley and my cousins. So no more at present from your undutiful niece, Mary Haydock. P.S. Mr. Scott took two guineas of me and said we could get my liberty. With my sister, he has been very ungood to me, so I must never see you again. So someone ripped her off, said they could get her off the crime. She gave them some money, probably from her aunt, and to, but she didn't. And that's her just before she got off here. She's obviously literate, so that's an advantage. She goes and works for, for a military officer, taking care of the, the young son, uh, teaching him English. Two years later, she marries that dude that she had some sort of chemistry with on the, on the boat, right? And he, that, was a, that was a good move. That was a good move. For the next, he was, he was a free settler and he knew about trade. So say, they started trading in property and grain. Whoops. Her name's Mary Raby and she owned this store. She is that lady you see on your $20 note. She's just, right? That's actually a bad photo. She looks much more like an innocent old lady. Like hardcore, just an innocent old lady, but a very sharp, wise old lady because Thomas died when he was 35 and she was about 28. And the business partner of Thomas died about a few months later. So, and Mary had seven children. So here she is, ex-convict, seven children, no background in anything with this, what? Single mum. Single mum. And then in those days, what hope you've got. And with a business empire small business empire to run with no experience. She smashes it, man, for the rest of her life and becomes one of the most respected people in this colony. She stayed, you know, the Bly question, she kept out of that. We don't know what side she was on, which is probably a very smart move. She, but she was a very strong favorite of Lachlan Macquarie. She perhaps had one regret. Lachlan Macquarie once, cause she's this big property person and you know, when he came, comes over and says, Mary, Mary, North Shore, man, have whatever you want. It's, and it's the future. And she goes, nah, it's, it's all rocks. So she didn't do much. What about Willamaloo? Willamaloo, you know, it's just all across the water. She says, ah, I wouldn't feed a bandicoot. <laughs> she obviously didn't want, uh, she didn't want that land because she wanted, had her eyes on Hawk, something on the Hawkesbury River. Just about anything else she touched turned to gold, including this. It's interesting that they have a memorial for Mary. We're right where, there you go, Brendan's stand. That's a memorial. She only owned this for a few months. She smashed out a huge profit because she took it off Piper's hands, right? And it was sort of a distressed sale. And this was later sold to a guy called Samuel Terry. But there's no memorial to him. There's, in fact, there's no memorial to Samuel Terry everywhere. And we'll, have, we'll find out a little bit later about why no one memorializes Samuel Terry. Okay. okay, so we're going to look at small scale entrepreneurship. These, the convicts were not put in jail when they arrived here, right? They were just put on the rocks and they were allowed to build their own houses if they had the skills. They were mostly thatched houses. This one was built in 1840, so we're jumping a little bit ahead. This used to be the sort of an Irish neighborhood, but the model of this shop which which is now a museum that you can go and see is very typical of early convict entrepreneurship they'd actually open up a part of their house to sell basically grog and stuff that they would get off the boats how did they get them off the boats though now this is a key key point they were sold by the dodgy military officials now in those days wholesale is okay retail that's for dodgy people so the wholesalers would sell this stuff to dodgy ex-convicts, right? And these are military officials, sometimes very high up, and then they would go and sell them onward at a higher price, usually out of their homes. 
this street down there was prob you're probably going to get people allowing their room out for a night, especially during the sealing season. That was a massive part of this area around about the 1810s and 1820s, right? Seal and you get these big ceiling dudes coming down here looking for drink, whatever. Single women would, you know, offer themselves and their, their, an inn and some food, whatever, to these people that would pass by. So this, this is an ex example of one. It's just a person's house, but you could make a lot of money and you'll see how some of the key entrepreneurs that we're going to talk to a little bit later, how they made their money from doing just this. All I want to, these are, so they dug up these, you know, a few decades ago and they found lots of old convict stuff and various ages since then. But I want to just show you this one bottle, Starkey's Ginger Beer. The dude was a, a convict who arrived here in about, uh, 1819, and he just wanted to start up a gin, he just enjoyed ginger beer. And ginger beer was kind of good because it wasn't necessarily alcoholic, but it tasted a bit like beer. And they hadn't invented hops at that point. This guy smashes it. This becomes an Australian institution uh, for many years. You can read his advertising. It's, I find it really funny. It's very matter of fact. It's like, like a convict trying to sell stuff. He's like, dude, it's ginger beer. It tastes good, drink it. <laughs> like, you read it, that's his advertising. Was, he was a huge hit, um, and he eventually sold in the, that, well, eventually the company sold in the 1950s to Shelley's, which then sold to Kirk's. So if you ever see Kirk's ginger beer, this was the inspiration. I'm sure it doesn't taste anything like the original. But his house, he bought a mansion in Dulwich Hill, and it was up for sale a couple of years ago. And on the Slack group, you can see link, links to the mansion that he, now he was a convict that smashed it purely from ginger beer, following something that he loved, happened to be a killer product at that time, solved some of the alcohol problem. I love his advertising, check, check it out, it's hilarious. Okay, you are standing in possibly the most notorious part of Sydney ever. This was knocked down in about 1920s for the Car Hill Expressway, but that's what the street looked like probably in about 1900. I, this young dude, man, I feel sorry for him for the things that he would have seen here, okay? This is an example of the inns. People would make money of having inns and selling alcohol. This is an extreme example of that, okay? Right about here was a very infamous pub called the Black Dog, okay? The Black Dog was originally built by a, by a convict free, free man, but it was rebuilt in the 1820s by our, that Samuel Terry guy I mentioned. Um, what it's famous for was a little bit later, but it always had this very terrible reputation, man. People used to drink its stuff and like die in the streets, <laughs> right? Um, and there, you can read stories about it. There was a big inquiry about why is everyone dying at the Black Dog? And part of it is because they used to add preservatives to it to, to make it longer. They used to di dilute it. It was a little bit out of control in this section. It was licensed, but the government tended to turn a blind eye. And, it, you know, you basically got the low class. You got the sealers coming up here, especially the sealers. Maoris were dropping, 100%, dropping all over the place. They had a notorious drink called Blow Me Skull Off. You can check it. It was basically rum, uh, cayenne pepper, uh, and uh, uh, some dodgy, seriously dodgy stuff I can't remember, and opium. Okay. They had, but that was the nice one, man. They had this other drink called the Cape Wine, which just had a, a, a number of unmentionable drugs, is all they, what they, they said. And people, People probably died more from Cape, Cape wine, right? But it was licensed. Right next to it was an even infa more infamous pub called the Sheer Hulk. Right, probably around about there. Now, really bad things happened here. Like, like really bad things, man. Like, um, kids went missing. They used to get 
you know, people would have exotic animals that they'd smuggle in and they'd have this like no, monkey running around, scratching people's face, faces off. It was just out of control area of Sydney. I want to read to you so that, you know, you can see firsthand this guy that we've never really, no one's ever found the identity of, but he was presumably a pretty high class dude who was a visitor to, who was an unfortunate visitor to this area in about the 1830s. And here's what he writes about back to England, because you probably couldn't get it published here, about these areas. We went into two houses, the one called the Black Dog, a licensed house, the other close beside it, an old dilapidated place, properly enough called the Sheer Hulk, which had been deprived of its license on account of the practices and characters admitted by its landlord. It was, however, still occupied, and as the occupier was no longer under the apprehension of losing his license, the scene displays nightly were of tenfold worse character than ever. At the present time, I shall not enter into further description of this den than by remarking that we found it to be full of suffocation of the lowest women, sailors and ruffians who supported themselves by waylaying and robbing and often murderously wounding any intoxicated sea officer, newly arrived immigrant or upcountry settler who might chance to wander into this infernal precinct. And as part of the occupation of the women was to act as lures, of course, this was no rare occurrence. Welcome to the rocks, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so this used to be the site of the first hospital, which was the makeshift hospital that they actually imported on the Second Fleet, luckily, because Second Fleet was such a disaster, right? And right across, just next door here, used to be the storehouse uh, that was lived in by Dr. John White, who was a surgeon. And one day, a young dude, soon after arriving, about a year later, broke into that place and stole some, what he called medicines. He stole pepper and this spice called whorehound, which happens to be good for sort of indigestion. He claimed that it was for his pregnant wife. Now, usually stealing like that would get you the death penalty, you'd get hung, right? But they gave him, the, the sentence was 150 lashes now. Anyone, anyone a drink over? Okay. And 150 when you could bear it. Now, it was known that 300 lashes was about enough to kill somebody. So if you were given 300 lashes, that was a death sentence. He was given 300 lashes, but they had this weird clause that says, oh, we'll, after 150, we'll let you have a rest. Why? He broke into the hospital's warehouse. Most people die. Years later, in a government inquiry from the British government came over here and checked things out, they found out that this guy, James Squire, had been brewing beer on the sly for government officials ever since he got over here. Whorehound also tastes a little bit like hops, right? So someone probably pulled some strings and got him off, off the hook. Later on, the place behind here, when this hospital was demolished, some places opened up to buy houses. And this one guy, we've got to talk about him now, but I'm only going to talk about a little bit standing outside because I don't, please feel free, man. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I'm afraid of his ghost, man. This, this is a hard school <laughs> story. Basically, he arrives a little bit later. His name's Samuel Terry. Samuel Terry is the richest person ever to come out of Australia, ever. Kerry Packer, no, no, no. Mike Cannonbrooks, no, no, no. He was the rich, he's, if, if his properties were valued now, he'd be worth $27 billion. Now, he bought his first place just before here. He'd actually had a farm in Parramatta with his wife. He decided to buy a house in Pitt Street. And he, and he creates an inn out of it, which is called the Bunch of Grapes. The lady next door also has a place in Pitt Street. She's not a convict, but she was married to a convict. It's a little bit strange why a late single lady was able to get a place in Pitt Street in those days. And there's a story that has a connection to UTS. I don't know if you want to know this or not, but 
The story that Samuel Terry's ancestor tells in his, her biography of Samuel Terry was that when Samuel met this lady who lived next door, the single lady in Pitt Street, she had three kids. And Samuel eventually leaves his wife to go with, with this lady. But how did this lady get this Pitt Street property? Turns out that, according to her, she was the housekeeper for a guy called John Harris, who was the chief surgeon of the colony. Do you know Harris Street? That John Harris. Do you know Ultimo? That's his farm. Do you know Ultimo House? Maybe not. That's where UTS is built. That's probably where he secretly had an affair with Rosetta, had a son called John that became the adopted child of Samuel Terry. So I'm sure you all want to know that piece of gossip. It's not very impactful to their life, but it is impactful to the ancestors, uh, the, the, the descendants, because this biographer was shame, a bit shameful about being descended from Samuel Terry, but she gets to say that actually she descended from the son of Rosetta, right, and John Harris, and that looks a little bit better. That's, it's an important point about character that we'll talk about a little bit further. But Samuel Terry. Samuel Terry moves in with Rosetta in Angel Place, you know, yes. but there's no Angel Place there, but that's where they had it. And Samuel Terry from then starts his business empire. Now, I'm going to take, this is where we've got to cross the road so that we don't disturb the, the, the dead. So, okay, we've got to talk about Samuel Terry. And you've got to make your own judgment whether you think, what do you got to think of this guy? There was a guy who used to live about here. His name was Daniel Mackay. He was the town jailer. He was also a convict. He'd had a pretty good relationship with the military dudes. But one day, he tells of a story of how Samuel Terry stripped him of his property and his reputation for the rest of his life. And he lost this place to Samuel Terry. Let me read out, rather than me putting a bias on it, this reverend in the 1840s had heard some stories about this guy called Samuel Terry, the richest man in Australia. And this is what he wrote about Samuel and the scheme. Terry's public house in Sydney, this was, the, uh, this was the Angel Place, was the resort of small settlers who occupied farms in the agricultural districts of the colony. And during a stay of several days at his house, they would run up a bill from five pounds to 50 pounds for under the influence of Bacchus. Bacchus is the god of wine, right? They would proceed from drinking of beer to brandy, from brandy to port, from port to champagne, and prompted by the social and jovial god would invite all persons in the house to participate in their portations. Confronted with the bill and full to the ears with drink from champagne downwards, the reckless farmers would assign their properties to Terry in settlement, the landlord Terry, having a large supply of the necessary legal documents ready, readily on hand. Like, oh, no problem, man, just uh, sign this one. <laughs> So, Terry, by 1817, owned a fifth of all the Sydney properties and he owned 50% of all the ex-convict properties. Now look, he didn't do anything illegal in those days, right? He basically said, we'll, we'll settle, you give me your house, it'll be cool, I'll give you a few drinks. <laughs> you know, and they were drunk and he would misuse that. But he did other things. Later on in his life, he became a big philanthropist. He was never well liked. He, tried, he was the biggest shareholder in the Bank of New South Wales, tried to become a director three times and got rejected. But he finally made it in the end. He was a big donator to schools and churches, and in particular, the, Mace, the Masonic dudes, the Freemasons. So, we don't talk about him much in Australia. It's funny, isn't it? He was the richest man, but uh, that's how he made his money. I don't know how you feel about that. How much of entrepreneurship is deception? 
oh, I'm bigger, you know, oh, come and join my marketplace. We've got thousands of people joining on or faking content or faking users, I mean, or saying a bigger story than you really believe. Where's the boundary line? Now, Samuel's probably gone a little bit too far, um, but he was never arrested. It was perfectly legal. He was actually a very big contributor to the local economy. So that's Samuel. You're not going to read about him in the history books. There is a public, there is a primary school in out near Penrith called the Samuel Terry Public School. If you read on the website, there's no about us history section. <laughs> okay, just here, just along here, is where an ex-convict, emancipated, started Australia Post, basically. He started a post office right out of his house. Now he'd made money by doing various things like set up an inn. That's what people did. They set up an inn, they sold grog. So in some sense, you're kind of taking from the, the stupid people who'd spend their money on grog and you're becoming rich and then investing in entrepreneurial things. That's kind of how the economy worked. And you're getting that, that opportunity from the dodgy military officials. That's how this all started. Man, welcome to Australia. Australian history. Um, he set up a place here uh, and that started Australia Post and he was actually, see they'd arrest these entre successful entrepreneurs because they'd do something that was just slightly against the regulation and they'd put him in jail. They tried to put him back to uh, Norfolk Island but you know he had enough supporters to, to, to bring him back here. That was Isaac Nichols. He was actually the, super, the superintendent of of uh, police at one point. So you see this, are you confused about who's the good guys and bad guys yet? That's the swamp, the mix of characters that we have here. This is all we had to work with, right? And it was later on when we talked about Lachlan Macquarie who sort of thought, man, mate, we're just gonna have to live with this. Just cause you've done something bad, doesn't mean you're a worthless person. Anyway, we'll walk on a little bit further. This, this place here, remember Mary's husband dies? Well, you'd think that she'd have a bit of a rest because overwhelming seven kids. No, she doesn't rest. The next year she sets up one of the biggest warehouses in Sydney right here and starts importing a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, here's a notice from 19, 1812. I won't read it all, but it's like coats, jackets, trousers, uh, English shawls, you know, she was trying to advance the culture of Sydney at that point. She really stepped up at that said, that's okay, I'm going to make this into a cultural place. Rice and coffee, coffee cups, I love the last bit, I mean, just love some of the com and uh, coffee cups and saucers uh, with numerous other articles too tedious to mention. This is her <laughs> advertisement. It was right, right here. Now their properties this is an important point that we'll discuss at the next stop, but their properties cut across here. And you'll see why that's important here. They were actually, there was a house here, but they had a property all the way up there. And we'll see why that's important in the next stop, in the next two stops. This place here was the home and the first business of a guy called Henry Cable. Now Henry Cable is probably the least talented, least educated, of all our entrepreneurs, which, suggest, which really tells a lot about him, because he did a lot to solve this puzzle that makes Sydney what it is. He was just a hustling dude, man, right? The Cable family, man, you could check it out. The Cable, the cable family is a opera. You could make an opera out of the Cables. What happened was, he got a pretty terrible start to life. He broke into a ladies, rich ladies place, and they did some pretty pretty audacious things like stealing meat right out of the cupboards, and it's, that's pretty, you normally just steal the valuables and run off. This break-in that got him sent to Australia was organized by his dad, who got hung for this, right? He got sent to Australia. Now, while he's waiting in jail in England, he meets this girl in, one, in the exercise yard or whatever it is, and somehow they hit it off. They conceive a child in jail. It turns out that her name is Susanna and she was shipped to Australia. 
and she's taking her baby with her on the boat. And, and the guy at the at the port says, "You can't, you can't take the baby. It's no, well, there's no baby here." And this became a massive drama in her hometown. It was all over the papers. The local community ra uh, raised a whole bunch of money to try to take care of the baby, maybe to try to appeal to the government. The guy who stopped her, who was now in charge of the baby, because she was on, and this is a big disaster, he single-handedly drives into London to try to appeal to the authorities to sort of let the baby on. Eventually, it was accepted, and Henry was allowed to go with them and take the baby there. It's this big romantic love story, and they've had thousands of de descendants. And one of the descendants wrote a whole series of romance novels about about Henry and Susanna and the story, hardcore, you can buy them. And in 17, 1988, in the bicentenary of Australia, the first fleet landing, there were 500 people there, all descendants of the Cables, celebrating their life. And there used to be a monument, I can't find it anymore, but you can see it online. Uh, Henry was a jailer at one point, but he got kicked, he got removed because he because he did some dodgy deal, as they all did. But Henry, Henry made one great move in his life, okay? He probably was doing dodgy deals with the military. A lot of you find, you'll find that a lot of the convicts were, if it wasn't for the military doing dodgy deals, the convicts wouldn't have got their start. So he probably made a lot of money from that and that's how he got his, his end. But he made a very smart entrepreneurial move with one of the people we're gonna meet across here it, shortly, let's see if is there anything else. Uh, oh, he also started. He was also they were trying stuff, man. He was a real hustler. He tried to start the first stagecoach here. It failed. You know, Paramount, the roads were too bumpy. But um, but it's just fascinating. A dude like him. Oh, that's it. Sorry. The Cable family, man. They have all these stories. It's this huge thing. You can see their website. There's hundreds of these cables everywhere. One of the stories was that it wasn't Captain Philip, you know, when we were at Rawson, that's, that got onto the sand first. Because, remember, he's dressed in his regalia. He doesn't wear boardies and, right? So someone's got to carry him in the last few metres off the boat and they get to step. And Henry said it was him that carried. Now, that's the myth. We don't really know. Henry... You know, there's a bit of folklore in the whole Cable family, but Henry claimed that he was the guy that first set foot in Australian colony by carrying Philip onto the sand. Maybe we'll never know. Next stop up here. This nondescript place is possibly the most important part of Sydney. Right where we're standing, just about, just over here. And the reason is, You've all heard of Botany Bay, right? And they still talk about, if you read the history books, about the settlement in Botany Bay. But you know where Botany Bay is, it's not here. The reason was they were meant to land in Botany Bay. They did land in Botany Bay, but they didn't find enough water there. So they took a risk, up anchored, while well, the French were, by the, that's another story, but the French, you know that? History people. And, um, and they came out to this other place that. James Cook had written a sort of a footnote to Port Jackson. And they found here a whole bunch of fresh water. This place here used to be what's called the, the mouth of what's called the tank stream. The tank stream was a stream that ran this to the, that, the left of Pet Street, crossed over, and then up Pitt Street on the other side, and then hooked back into Hyde Park where there was a sort of lagoon there. And that was enough water to feed the, sort of keep the colony going. And that's why Sydney is based where it was here. And as you can kind of see, if you, when you check this out, it kind of makes sense that this was the mouth. That ship in was built on the mouth of the, of the tank stream. Now, uh, this was actually sort of became dirtier and dirtier over the years, as you'd expect. By about 1820s, it became sort of the unofficial sewer. By the 1830s, it was the official sewer. <laughs> and then by the 1850s, they started to close this over. Now, Pitt Street didn't exist from about Hunter to here. 
Remember I said it did this funky thing where it crossed over? You know some streets like Bolai Street, a few other streets are a bit on this angle? That's because the tank stream did this funky thing, right? It crossed over and, they, and, and there was no street that could cross here without building a bridge, which they did build a bridge, and guess what it was called? Right, Bridge Street, which we'll go see. The Bridge Street was over the Pitt Street, but it was, it was um, right at the place where this flooded area, by the way, would be flooded from the, the top of the Museum of Contemporary Arts, and then would go all the way parallel to George Street and come back to Bridge Street. And this was all flooded, only during high tide. And that's important, you'll see why it's important in the next two stops. But it was, as a result, entrepreneurial center. This place here is entrepreneur center. I'm gonna ask you in a little while why you think it was entrepreneurial center soon. Mary Raby, our, our lady hero, she used to have, she and her husband used to have a place that ran along here in, into the back, the backed into the tank, tank stream. If you go up further here, on the right, you'll see a plaque to the Bank of New South Wales. This was where the Bank of New South Wales started. It started in her house. That's how respected she kind of was. And you'll see, right, and her house was here in this big strip of land, strip of land that, now, can anyone guess why we had one of our key entrepreneurs that I'm going to talk about now had properties up here that backed onto this flooded tank stream? Anyone want to take a guess? Why would they flood and then they'd go out, they'd flood? Why would all the entrepreneurs? What's that? Breweries. No, no, but that's a fair answer. Okay, I'll stop. Yes, they were all traders. They all had warehouses. So they didn't care about this muddy stuff here. What they wanted was access to the water at a height. Right, and they'd build warehouses along here, and all the, our key entrepreneurs were traders, all trying to get this swampy land to to have access directly to the water, because all that was taken up by Campbell and the government, and right by that stage. So we'll move on to the next one now. Dedication here to grants of Raby and Thompson. So Raby had this plot here. There was another guy called Thompson. He was also a convict. He started in grains. But he wasn't as heroic as our other one, so I don't talk about him very much. But, but basically, the convict entrepreneurs wanted the piece of this. And you'll see all the... And here's another one. See, can you see... Do you know that street there? And can you see the name of that cafe? Underwood. So that, that's called Underwood Lane. And if you go up there, there's a plaque celebrating the birth of Australian shipping. James Underwood was just a convict dude with no skills that was assigned to shipbuilding. He was like your modern day hacker dude. All he wanted to do is learn a skill, do his hacky stuff and build boats. The hustler dude across the road, our friend, the big passionate dude that's like carrying his baby and saving the world with no skills, obviously had a chat with James and said, hey man, bro, seals man, you got boats, I got the hustle. Let's get, go clubbing. No, that's really bad. That's, uh, I can't, I, it's, anyway, poor seals. They got together and they, they started, probably were the most successful sealers in Australia. And why could they do it? Well, one of the things about sealing was that you didn't need a big boat. For whaling, you did. You could take a fairly small boat and you could grow. You could bootstrap. And that's, that's what James and, um, and Henry did. They started the sealing industry. James, James's shipyard, which he built off, the, off his place, was, was just up there. You can see a memorial to it. But they were about to take it to a whole new level. After these two young dudes got together, they hooked up to another dude, and it just really exploded from there. And we'll talk about that in the next stop. So this is Macquarie Place. Named after Lachlan Macquarie, by Lachlan Macquarie, right? But it was a very important place, as I mentioned. These were where the on big entrepreneurs had their places. You see that Mary's? That's probably marks the outer edge of Mary's property. I'm guessing, well, right, right next to it. But 
there was another guy here who really smashed it out of the park. And I'll show you, I'll, I actually I probably should take you up there in a sec. But just a little bit more about James that I forgot to tell you. One sec. So James also, just a few other things about James. He encouraged his brother to come over here who was a free settler. That's kind of ironic because he's saying, because he's like the shame of the family. And he's like, dude, you, you've got to come over here, man. You can smash out of the park. There's seals, there's boats, there's money. And so his brother Joseph comes over and also smashes it out of the park in sealing as well. This became a very important destination, but that was going to cause very big controversy and I'll talk about that up here. This house, see Kyle House? This was the location of one of the most successful convict entrepreneurs' houses called Simeon Lord. He had a magnificent house here and he made his money through trading, but he had an even better in because he worked for the customs house, plus he worked for a dodgy military dude doing trading stuff. So we really got to see how trading worked. He probably made a lot of money on the side and that's how he bought his house. But then he scaled it right up because what he would do when eventually the monopoly was broken down and ships would come in here, he'd be the first one out there going, hey man, because he's an agent. He says, man, we'll sell your stuff. You can come at my beautiful mansion, sleep overnight. We've got a warehouse for you. We, this is the best house in Sydney, man. So he would just get all the traffic here. He was also, he had connections to London, but he had, now it was dodgy to have connections to London as a convict. So he had some financial entrepreneurship dodginess here. What he used to do, you were not allowed as a convict to have a boat over a certain size take to Asia, okay? Because you'd be competing with the English East India Company. So what he used to do was mortgage boats right, to English companies, so it'd be under his control, but in their name, right? That's how we did it. And in and, and those days, use of the law was dodgy, but the law was meant to be the foundation of everything. So he was very clever at, at doing that. And he went to Underwood and Cable and said, man, I see what you're doing. I like what you're doing. Let's take it to, to the next level and go after the London hat market. And that's what they did, and they magnified it by a bunch of, by a huge amount of time. Meanwhile, Bly comes in. Bly does not like what's going on. What are these dudes smashing it out of the park for? These guys are now really, really powerful dudes. They're convicts, man. This is supposed to be a place of punishment. What's going on? They, he makes a law that makes it tighter about how to get ships in here. S Simeon Lord writes him a letter asking for an exception. And this is all he wrote. This is the letter he writes to Bly. Simeon Lord writes to Bly, right? It has always been the custom. He writes long, Your Excellency, blah, blah, blah. This is, didn't just go, hey, brah, check this. <laughs> It has always been the custom on London River where an officer from the custom house is on board a vessel to allow the owner of her to unload her in the most convenient and least expensive method to himself and we therefore trust that you will not put us to so much expense and risk in removing the cargo by boats. So he's basically saying, for some reason Bly did not want to have an accompanying, accompanying ship, when, right, but it was safer and less expensive if you had an accompanying ship and he was like saying, hey Bly man, I know you got this rules but dude, this is the way it's always been, and we're doing good for the community with our staff, right? Please let us on. Bly arrests all three and puts them in jail. These very successful entrepreneurs, he goes, right, you're off to jail. That was rude. How dare you? You're right? Like he's, he's saying, that, I didn't like the tone of that. How dare you ask me to break the law for you, right? So Bly, would, Bly pissed people off. He didn't just piss off the military, who these guys you know, they were trying to break the monopoly of. He just pissed off the entrepreneur community as well. Okay, so anyway, he becomes massively successful dude after the sealing industry has, you know, wanes. They actually break up with like lawsuits and all sorts of things. It's 
but that's that's the sad part of it. Um, but he 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 ends up, you know, one of the wealthiest guys in Australia. He starts the manufacturing industry in Australia in hats, and it actually does a pretty good job. But the British thought it was going to be. You see, we're still as con. What are we doing? Smashing stuff out of the park here, man. You're we're Britain. You're Australia, right? What are you doing making hats as good as us? So it was a threat to the to the trading companies in Britain that we started to develop manufacturing, right? So it didn't get resources. It wasn't closed down, but didn't get resources. And something else happened that would take Australia to a whole new level that didn't involve manufacturing. And we'll talk about that on our next stop. See this dude, just incidentally, this dude here, he's an, he's an inventor dude. He's very important. He's not a convict. He's a free settler. He invented sort of refrigeration, which you can imagine in a hot country like this with large distances, refrigerations of good was really, really important. He was an inv so an innovator. But I think it's, personally, I think it's a bit rude putting his statue right outside Simeon Lord's statue. This guy is probably, no, this guy, hardcore, is probably the most important person ever in economic history in Australia. And he wasn't a convict. But man, I don't know. I don't see how anyone could possibly like this guy. But I'm really... But I was probably like this at school as well. And I probably, you guys know people like this at school. We're probably all a little bit like this at school, but he was like this at school and for all of his life. He actually ended up in a lunatic asylum. His name's John MacArthur, right? He was a troublemaker, man. Just a constant troublemaker. He's the sort of guy, I think I was, honestly, I think I was like this, I have to admit. Well, you just think you're better than what life has given you, always. That's John MacArthur, man. He just picked fights, but he played by the rules, which is the worst part of him, <laughs> because you couldn't really get him in trouble that much, you know? Well, but they tried. He arrived on the second fleet, and as I mentioned, the second fleet's pretty bad. You can imagine the trouble he had on that. He challenged the, one of the captains to a duel, a, right? And there was, they both missed, fortunately. That's when you shoot, right? They both missed, but you're not supposed, duel is this, this what class, you know, high class people do to defend their honor kind of thing, right? But it's not legal, it's just sort of this, unwritten thing that we have a duel and see who wins, who lives. He came here in 1790, he was awarded, he was nominated as the paymaster. And that was when the trouble began because he could see that the military could gain control by using rum, right? And this is where this control of the economy by the military started. He eventually did resign because people realized that you know, he was the troublemaker. He put a complaint about the governor above the governor's head. And the governor, that, was, that contributed to Hunter eventually being removed. In 1800, he has a duel again with his commanding officer, William Patterson. The dude's just like, man, we're gonna, I challenge you to a duel. Like, I just can't, I can't imagine. But anyway, he actually hits Patterson. Patterson misses. Patterson doesn't die, but his shoulder, because you'd stand like this, right? <gasps> you know, obviously. You know, try to make yourself as uh, target as you could. Um, and his shoulder's ruined. And, uh, and he's arrested, right? I'm not, he's arrested, but it's sort of like, yes, but I understand this is about your honor. He was sent back to England. And you'd think this would be the end of his career by this stage, right? I mean, you could, there was a lot of people who didn't like him. But the military kind of did because he was doing things for the military. He was good at political manoeuvring. He was sent back to England and you'd think this might be the end of him. But what he does is he starts pitching Australia to the British authorities. So he's going above the governor's head now again. And he's saying, man, Australia, man, wool, man. This is the place for wool. I've got a farm. He has a farm. And, and wool is going to be the killer product from this colony. So in turn, so he turns around this shame and everything into, no, 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 you don't understand, because I've got a bigger picture. 
I want to, I want to make Australia successful. So the British guys are like, yeah, you know, the guy's smart, right? He is very smart. He's, and he's very accomplished and very talented, but he's just got this thing of anyone telling him what to do. You know what I mean? I mean, we're all entrepreneurs, man, but this dude was hardcore. So they, give, they say, okay, man, we'll give you a try. Go, here's a letter, tell the governor, give, give you a bunch of land, you can try this big wool experiment. You're not in the military anymore, but you will give you a big chunk of land. And that's a little bit rude because the governor is supposed to be doing that. He goes back home. The governor's like, oh, no, not you. Oh, shit, that guy again. <laughs> but he goes, dude, I've got some... I'm obviously translating here in modern entrepreneurial language. Um, I've, got, I've now got 18,000 acres and we're going to do some wool experiment. And they start that. And actually, the wool stuff starts to go well. He, he, he uh, breeds this particular type of sheep merino sheep that's part spanish part indian i think but it has very very high quality wool so i don't know if that's luck or brilliance or whatever but he starts to, to build that but then enter his who you know the nemesis the guy who's the opposite on the other, the other side who's got the same kind of personality and that's bligh and bligh does not like macarthur he's trying to say it's not that he doesn't like MacArthur. Well, he doesn't like MacArthur. No one likes MacArthur. But he's trying to put order. And he's trying to say, you powerful people, you need to know your, the order here, right? You've got too much power. So MacArthur was granted a piece of land just across here, right across here. And he had a beautiful house here and this lovely square. This was exactly like it was, you know, back in his day. And it's got these beautiful churches. You'll see there's two of them here. And they, see where that... That was another third church. So it was this beautiful square. And Bly, I think he was just trying to, he was trying to play legal games, but he just wanted to undermine MacArthur's power and say, I can take this back from you. And so this was the beginning of the trouble. There was further troubles with Bly and MacArthur was one of the instigators to the, to the overthrow of, of, of Bly. When they, and when they overthrew Bly and put the military in, they started granting themselves land and they started doing all this, right? And that was finally overturned when Lachlan Macquarie came over. Lachlan Macquarie turned over everything and he sent, he sent uh, MacArthur back to England again to stand trial. MacArthur says, I can't stand trial for mutiny because I'm not military. I'm a free citizen. You can't, I'm, it's, there's no mutiny here. So they're like, oh, dude, he's got us on this legal tactic. We well, admit you're wrong. And if you want to go back to Australia, we'll let you in. He goes, I'm not admitting I'm wrong. I did nothing wrong. So he stays there for about seven years. And eventually they go, whatever, let's go back home. <laughs> he goes back home. He smashes the wool industry. He turns Australia into the richest country in the world per capita, per I should say per settler, because we're not counting the Aboriginals, which is unfortunate. Per cap, per settler, the richest country in the world within 50 years of settlement, all because of this wool industry. The key about wool was, you just, here's the key of, about wool and why it worked in Australia. Apart from he had a really good, he had really good sheep. The key was that you just don't respect crown land. You just keep pumping the sheep in there and crossing all the boundaries and you just say, just, just, and you just take whatever land you want and just graze sheep. You don't need much fertile land or anything. And you just take crown land. You could scale sheep like it was a highly scalable business. And wool was very much in demand. Wool changed. Wool was one of the two biggest things in Australia that changed us from this little economy to so, and we have to have, thank this imperfect guy who ended up in asylum, who was on the $2 note, which you guys are probably too young to remember, except for some of us, right? <laughs> MacArthur. And actually, that's a, two, that's a good picture of him. He, he looked meaner than that. He looks quite handsome there, but this is, you have a look at him, he looks, he, but he ended up in an asylum, but very, very rich, very, very rich guy. And we have him to thank, frankly, for pioneering an industry that really saved Australia. So we're coming to the end, but you might be asking, well, Pete, man, you've got Samuel Terry, you've got, you got all these dodgy characters doing dodgy deals. Like, is it all just this, is that what Australia is? Just this bunch of random 
dudes in self-interest? Well, yeah, pretty much, but pretty much, but it is people following their self-interest. But I think the magic in Australia, if there's, if there's a magic to it, is that they learned through all this shit fight, all this drama to kind of being acceptance of flaws in so-called character that you can be a better person. Before those days, it was class and character. And if, no, 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 you could do bad stuff. You can be a convict. You, convict, you can have the lowest form of reputation and then smash out an industry. Australia, perhaps that's the magic of Australia, that it was very accepting that you, of the wrongs that people did and understood there's potential in everybody. So if there's one lesson of Australia that's a, that, that fits the Hollywood ending, that's probably what I'd say. Right, we have one more final stop. This is called the malt shovel. This has no connection to any convict that I'm aware of. Um, I mean this place, except for the name. James Squire, when he first worked out how to grow hops, he was the first person to grow hops. He started a pub in Kissing Point, which is near Ride. You know that, that area? That's where his inn was. I'm sorry, man. You, yeah. um, and he started an inn called the Malting Shovel. That was the name of his distillery. So this is named in honor of him. He actually spent most of his time after he stole some stuff in Parramatta. He was actually on the first fleet, but before he was on the first fleet, he kind of hit the jackpot twice. The dude was criminal, sort of a lifetime criminal until he came here, you know, and then he, well, <laughs> even then. But before then, he was actually taken to the US and he fought in the War of Independence on the British side for, for highway robbery. He came back, started up his highway robbery business again, and he got sent over here to Australia. And within a year, as I said, he was brewing beer, pretend beer, for the, for the military people. That's all James seemed to care about, man, was beer. Like there was rum going on and grog and everything else, but he just wanted to, to grow beer, man, the whole of his life. Just wanted to crack the formula of how to grow hops here. He finally did on the Kissing Point place. Um, a few, but we think that he read an article in the Sydney Gazette in 1805, or some, I'm not sure he could read, but people around him, telling about how to grow hops in Britain. So he's probably copied the idea and got really excited about that. He'd, he'd be trying this in 1799, so that was a few years later, but he cracked it and he was the first one to grow beer and that's all he cared about. He had other businesses, but he never lost his beer interest and he thought it was a sort of this, he was a community dude. He's like your, your, he's like your modern entrepreneur. He was friends with everybody. He was friends with the local Aboriginals. His best friend was Benelong, you know Benelong Point? He insisted when Benelong died that Benelong get buried on his property and you know to a little bit of a disgrace to Australia that just became a suburban backyard they, nothing signifying that Benelong was there maybe they lost the records I don't know but eventually fortunately a few years late few years before the New South Wales bought this crappy suburban house that happens to be the location of where Benelong was buried his funeral was the biggest ever in Australia, before Samuel Terry, who got to buy or half of Sydney to come and join it, but he was a good—he was a good dude, I guess. And he was kind of an example of someone who was deeply flawed. Uh, when he tried to do something, put his mind to it, he could actually give back, perhaps repenting for all the what he what other people might say were his sins. One final thing that he did was. Um, you know this, remember the story when he's got his, his girlfriend pregnant and he's trying to have, have, help her with medicine? Well, they, she was pregnant and she did have a kid and, and she got shipped to Norfolk Island, left the kid with him and he couldn't take care of it. So he enlists his nine months old kid in the army. And by the time the kid is nine years old, he's on the payroll and he's the drummer boy. True story. So that's it guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to come to us, we'll go to a, a pub up the road. Thanks a lot for coming. Very good. Great job. 
Well, without giving you know, a Hollywood ending, which is what I was talking about before, which is like, you know, Australia is, it did break down class. And it said, we value on what you can do. Look, I don't want to overplay the Australian story, but that is what happened. Convict dudes who were never meant to be rich contributed and solved the economic puzzle, right? That's true. And then really dodgy evil dudes like MacArthur took it to another level. But if there's lessons from them, just from entrepreneurship that I think are timeless, and there's very few that ever are timeless, but one thing you notice about all these successful guys, because bear in mind, most convicts were not successful. They were drunkards. They stayed at places like the Black Dog, and right? They were not. But the ones that were successful, they found a mentor and got into an area that was, that showed them the ropes. So a mentor that was very, very close to where they needed to go on the cutting edge of trading or the cutting edge of, uh, of innkeeping, whatever, right? I think that's one, I think that still applies. If you want to get ahead in a new industry, get yourself immersed in an, in an emerging industry, find people around you that are talking about industry, believe in the future and just know the ropes, do whatever. You know, these are convicts, these guys weren't caring about pay and mortgages and kids. They had nothing to lose, admittedly, but they all played the game and they all learnt the ropes, didn't get drunk. Henry Cable's a great example. He had no skills, he just hustled, probably was a good mate of the military officials selling their grog. But he got amongst it and he learned the game and he focused on it and he, he found the magic formula and became super rich. I think that's the other thing, one other thing, and we have to acknowledge this, right? Look, Australia was a pioneering country like it was a revolution. And like a lot of people got this start by grants of land. So when you're a conflict, they give you a land. It was a revolution. I would always suggest to you, try to find, oh, this is very general words, but try to get on the cusp of a revolution. Uh, how do you find that? Well, yeah, you know, I don't know, but I'm always looking for, if you want to be big, go on the cusp of a revolution. If you want to just be make a good, decent living, just follow what people on the edge of that revolution are doing and copy them. And that's pretty well how a lot of these guys, guys succeeded. Or become a really evil, like MacArthur, what's his lesson, man? Uh, MacArthur was an inspiration. Dude, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Bly was the loser, wasn't he? Who? Bly. Bly? He became very rich as well. Because they, oh, see, Bly was dodgy himself, man. Yeah. When he became governor, they, just before he became governor, the previous governor gave him all this land, so he wasn't getting it while he was governor. And that went on to, as Australia blew up, that became very, very, uh, 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 you know, worth a lot of money. And he became rich and retired rich and retired with high honours. He was, I'm sure the government knew that he was going to cause trouble. That's why he's there. He just had the mutiny on the bounty. They know he was a... He's a disruptor. They, they knew, the guys there are going, yeah, go on, see what you can do, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to cause some trouble. It did, it did solve some things. It certainly busted up the, um, the monopoly. It got a few good dudes arrested. Oh, the military was replaced at that point and Macquarie was able to bring in his own. So, yeah, they just sort of fed him to the walls and he was like, oh, shh, shh, shh. You know, then they, perf Yeah, you need, you need a disruptor. And he was, he was it, so that's why it's, if you look from a government point of view, or if you look for heroes, you're not, but the fact that he was the right guy at the right time, maybe, just I wouldn't have liked his life, I wouldn't have liked any of these guys a little bit, but, but what his contribution did, you know, do we, we made, it made a very big difference. It, it opened up the possibility to grow even, even further when the military didn't control everything. And then Macquarie, if there's another hero, look, the heroes of this story, if you want to believe in heroes, Robert Campbell, but he was doing it in his own, but he was, he was a good dude. Mary, Mary was an unbelievable lady, just smashed it out. And, and uh, yeah, Henry's pretty, Henry, well, he's a romantic hero, yeah. right? And probably Macquarie. Macquarie is the guy that probably thought, probably realized, man, there's value in convicts. Don't write them off. Because he, he actually has this famous quote where he said, the guys who are smashing it and doing the most good are ex-convicts. I can't ignore them, right? So that was not the attitude of the previous governors. And I think that was the acceptance of our flaws and of 
flawed upbringing, doesn't matter. And I think was, that's pos probably the magic of what became Australia. There's the Hollywood ending. You had to, had to draw me into a Hollywood ending. <laughs> yeah.